so um, last time uh, we stopped, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, with uh, function arguments, and this week we're turning about talking about return values. Um, and there's two things to consider when returning a value. Uh, does returning early make your function easier to read? And can you make your function pipeable? And my question is, why would this be a consideration? But that's, I believe, something that we can talk about <clears throat> later on. Um, yeah, I think uh, when we get to that section, we'll talk about it. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. So explicit return statements um, are, I think, by default, returns the last value of a function. Um, you can return a value without an explicit return statement. So you can see in this <clears throat> first function here, we just have Z kind of sitting out by itself. <clears throat> Excuse me. And that is what gets returned. So you can see one plus two is three. But then <clears throat> in the second function, you can also see that we have an explicit return statement for Z. And um, to me, uh, and I believe to the author of the book, this is, just makes the function easier to read. Um, you can see that there is something definitely being returned. <clears throat> also, you might want to have an explicit return statement to indicate the inputs for your function are empty. And this is a common thing to do. <clears throat> and that is shown right down below. Um, or if you have an if statement with one complex block and one simple block, it's more readable to list the simple block first. So um, when this first function, we have some like if x do something complicated, else return something short versus in this function, if it's not x, return something short <clears throat> and then do the complicated stuff. And that also maybe kind of relates to lazy computing or possibly. Uh, it, th that very well could because then it, mm -hmm. you don't or have to do all the, yeah, you yeah. don't have to do all the complicated stuff if you just return early. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, and so writing a pipeable function, it's important to think about your return value and type. If you know the object type, your pipeline will just work. Um, and there are two basic types of pipeable functions, transformations and side effects. Um, with transformations, an object is passed to the function's first argument and a modified object is returned. And I'm assuming that's like mutate. Pretty much like okay. anything in the tidyverse, basically. Uh, okay. You know, um, most of the functions, you're passing something into the function and getting something else out, whether that's through summarize, okay. through mutate, through select. Um, all okay. of those are, are doing a transformation. Okay. And then with side effects, the past object is not transformed. Instead, the function performs an action on the object, like drawing a plot or saving a file. Um, and I believe this was mentioned in the chapter on pipes as an action that can terminate a pipe. And that might be a case where you want to use the T pipe. Um, and so this function doesn't even look like it has something that will allow me to run it. Okay. Hmm. Huh. So we'll go down here. Okay. And then so this is um, a function just trying to show, or it will eventually show the missing values in the empty cars uh, data frame. Invisible is a command to return a temporarily invisible copy of an object. Um, so you can see that it is invisible because it's returning zero. Or well, it's, it's returning zero because it's invisible? It's printing missing values zero, but it's not returning, or it's not showing it's not any retu return. Uh, right, okay. Yeah. It's not actually returning anything. Yeah. So um, then in the next 
uh, piece of code here. Again, we have this missing values as zero, but we're just assigning it to X. And we can see that it is a data frame, so it's not just zero. Um, and it does have dimensions, um, 32 rows by 11 columns. And then in this, um, it actually gives you a count of the missing values. And then uh, let's see if we can go back to the prettier looking thing. OK. Yes. So before we go on, um, so that was that's what he was talking about with um, where you want to make it pipeable. It's basically so you don't have to use the T. Instead, it's returning MT cars in the, those functions. Oh, it's just, okay. It, it's, it's returning whatever comes in. And there are a fair number of um, tidyverse functions. I can't think of one off the top of my head, but there are things that it, it does something. It puts a plot into the console or it saves or like, I think, I think most of the reader are um, when you, when you write with radar, it returns the data frame that you passed in. So you can put it in the middle of a pipe. It does the save, but you can keep going because you've ah. got whatever came in. Okay. Um, it's basically just so you don't have to use that T pipe because no one remembers that the T pipe exists. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right, so um, moving on to environment. And the author says that you don't need to understand environment when you first start writing functions, but um, I <laughs> couldn't quite let it go. So I was just looking up other definitions. And basically, the environment can be thought of as a collection of objects, i.e. functions, variables, etc. And an environment is created when we first fire up the R interpreter. So any variable we define is now in this environment. And that was from a website called Data Mentor. Um, the environment of a function controls how R finds the value associated with a name. So this means you can have a function in which the variable is not defined. R will look outside the function in the environment. And this is what's called lexical scoping. Yes. OK. And <laughs> I thought it had something to do with like lexicography or words, but it's actually um, the process, lexing is the process that converts code represented as text to meaningful pieces that are comprehensible by programming languages. So it's more of a computer science term. <clears throat> so we can see in this first function that we've only defined X, but we also have X and Y in the function. Um, so then we can actually define why and still use the function and get it to work. Um, the last example in the book is showing that you can get into trouble with this. And I, so is this function really redefining the plus symbol so it no longer simply adds? Yes. Wow. Okay. <laughs> Yeah, um, R, R lets you be really dangerous is basically what he's talking yeah. about here. That, so there's the, um, like the base environment, the, the base R, like the, all the functions that are in base R. And then there's your global environment that can overwrite, like your, your environment is where it looks, where R looks first. So okay. you have your own copy of plus. It's like, oh, that one supersedes whatever else I might know about. So I'll use that. It can be useful, but it can also be very dangerous, as he shows here. Yes. <laughs> and I'm not going to run that. <laughs> but um, yeah, so that is chapter 19. Um, are there any questions? OK. I have one silly question, Becky. Can you scroll up? It was one Sorry. of the examples that had a cat function oh, and I'm yes. like what does that do so that is concatenate so it's oh. just making this this right here that I've highlighted it's just doing it's just a, it, a statement that will print out missing values colon missing and like whatever that number oh, is why isn't it just I thought c was concatenate or is c so, or something else 
C is is concatenate or combine, and then cat is concatenate and print. And the and print oh. part is important. Okay. And so when you call that there, like at that moment that um, the the missing value zero gets printed, that's the side effect. So that print happens um, separate from a return. So it doesn't actually return what it's concatenate or what it's catting. It just prints it to the console. Oh, okay, that makes sense. So, okay, I'm probably gonna get this wrong, but in Bash, when you do cat and then like a file name, it'll show you um, like the contents of the file. Yes. So I'm guessing that's what it's doing. It's just the printing same idea. The... Yeah. Got it. Okay. That append Great, equals you. false isn't commented, uh, Becky. So be careful with that. Oh, okay. <laughs> oh, I see what you mean. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That would have been interesting. Okay. It would have been confused. I mean, it would have just thrown an error. Um, but yeah. So so yeah, that that's important to know to understand what he's doing here. Like, if you didn't have the invisible DF this show missings function wouldn't return anything. It just does the cat and never uh, does anything to return. So it, would, it wouldn't have any return at all. With invisible DF, it's saying, okay, and now return whatever came in, but don't print it. That's basically what invisible means, like return it, but don't print it on the console. Um, yeah, does that all make sense? All right. Okay, I, I will stop sharing my screen. Let's okay. hand it over to Lucy for chapter 20. Can you see my screen? Yes. So I liked how um, Becky presented her work. So I thought I should uh, emulate that. So these are the objectives that uh, we'll be covering for this particular chapter. Yeah, as John has mentioned, they are, this chapter was quite intense. I actually managed to study half, more than half, yes. Okay, so um, as an introduction, since we have already learned we have already learned about the tables. This chapter, we will focus on vectors that do underline them. And for, for the prerequisites, is, um, we will be using the base R data structures. Therefore, we don't need to load any package. However, um, we will uh, we lose sorry, a couple of functions from the PAR package to avoid some inconsistencies in the base R package. So we will uh, we'll see this later. <laughs> okay, so let's load the part package from the tidy bus and we have it. So for the vector basics, we have two types of vectors. That is the atomic vectors, which are of six types, the logical integer, double character, and com complex and row. And um, integer and doubles are known as, collectively they're known as numeric vectors. And the other type of, of vectors is the lists, which at times are called recursive vectors because they'll contain lists, they'll contain other lists, sorry. So the main difference between vectors and lists is that vector, atomic vectors are homogeneous. So in my understanding, it was that it contains one only one type and at least are heterogeneous. That is, they contain different types. So exactly is... right, yep. Awesome. Okay, so another related object is null, which is often used to represent absence of a vector. 
and like the NA, which is used to represent the absence of a value. So this null will typically act like a vector of length zero, and it's as shown in this figure. So the summarize is that so we have vectors hierarchy. So this is the smallest as sorry, the simplest as we go down towards the most complex. So the logical, yeah, it has been summarized here. Yeah, the logical, the numeric being integer and double, and we have character, and we have a list in the null object here. So two key properties of vectors, it's, it's type, which can be determined by the function type of. And if we look at this, we see that the letters are characters and the one to 10 is an integer. Okay. I, I, I thought in okay. I thought in R the for numeric numeric numbers it's double the defaults. So I, I didn't understand what so it's giving here. Yeah, integer. Yeah. The colon actually coerces it to integer. So the okay. when you use the colon colon is technically a function in that case, and so it's turning it's creating an integer vector between one and ten. Okay. Right. So if you just did type of one, like, it would be double. Type. Type. Okay. Um. <laughs> Why is it? Yes. Oh, there it goes. <laughs> yeah. So yes, it's yes, it's a double. Okay. Does that does that make sense to everyone before we go on? Because I think that's and I I guess at this point I don't know if you know or if you care <laughs> like between the difference between an integer and a double. the The reason that that can become a thing is doubles take up more RAM than integers because you need to have room for things you know, information about the decimal place. And he also talks a, a little bit in the chapter about doubles are um, technically not, like they're not perfectly precise. Integers are exactly the integer, but the double is a decimal number that's being represented with binary and you can have weird things happen because of that. Um, so when something, when you know something can only be an integer, keeping it as an integer can be helpful for those reasons. And we'll talk about that more in a little bit. Yes. So the other, the other property is the length, which can be determined by the function length. So we have these two vectors. X1 is a list containing A, B, and 1 to 10. And if you look at its length, we have it as 3. And for X2, which contains A, and B, if you look at its length, we have it as two. So I was trying to understand what exactly the length function is doing here. And if I got it correctly, it is list, it gives the number of elements in a list, for example, for X1 and for X2, it gives the number of um, yeah, like elements in that vector. If I got it correctly. So Vectors do contain arbitrarily additional metadata in form of attributes, which are then used to create augmented vectors, um, which do build on additional behavior. And there are three different types of augmented vectors. We'll, list, we'll just mention here, but more will be discussed in the last section. Factors are built onto, on, top, sorry, on top of the integer vectors and the bits and data times are built on top of numeric vectors. And lastly, data frames and tables are built on top of lists. So our next, if no question, we can go to the next, the next section, which was the important types of atomic vectors. And um, so they are four most important types of atomic vectors, that is the logical integer double, and character. So it's worth to know that for row and complex will not be discussed in this part of discussion because 
they are readily used in the data analysis as stated by Dr. Hadley. So let's start from the simplest to the most complex and logical are the most simplest atomic vector, since they only take three possible values, that is the false, um, true, and NA. So they can be constructed with comparison operators, or we can construct them by hand using the concatenate function. So we have, this is, we can, as, so I, uh, I was trying to understand what is exactly happening in this example. We have uh, uh, the from one to 10, the modulus of three, we want to compare if it's equals to zero and it will return false or true. So if I understood correctly, it's that for, for example, one will be one modulus three and this modulus returns, returns reminder. So um, one divided by three, which is 0 0.33, but then if I got it correctly that it is less than one, it returns one. Yeah. Yes. But then yep. if I try to make the same load, but, but I have also a question. So if I we take two divided by three, it is 0 0.667. Yeah, into like three decimal places, but then it returns two. Why not one and 0 0.6666 so, is less than one? So it's the remainder. So if you take two divided by three, it's zero with two left over. So that's just oh, the, the that's okay. what the modulus does. It's what it's it does integer division and then returns the leftover. It does like, you know, um uh very starting division, like when you were when you're first learning division, where it actually does the remainder. And the way it's useful is if you look at something like this, um, you know, this one to 10 modulo three equals equals zero, it's saying, what are the ones that are evenly divisible by three? It's a way that you can say, just give me every third value. Because if you say, I only want the cases where this is true, let's say you go, you know, row num modulo three equals equals zero, though it'll only give you every third case, um, which, can often be a useful way to sample something is, you know, you just want, I want it evenly divided throughout the time so you can do something like that. Um, that's why he used that. That's why I suspect he used that as an example. Sorry, okay. can I, um, I think, now I have a dumb question. Why isn't it returning true or false? Is? I thought oh, it was divisible by. She just ran it without the equals equals zero. Oh, to, okay, to, thank to you. visualize it, yeah. Yeah, 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 okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so good to know. And so we can also create uh, this the logical vector using the concatenate as shown in this example. Uh, the next, now the, the other simpler is the numeric. And as you have learned, is that integer and double are collectively known as numeric vectors. And in R, so the numbers are doubles by default, as you've seen in, an, in the example. And if you want to create an integer from a double, we place L after that particular number. And if we do this, in this example, sorry, we see that the type of one is a double and the type of one L is an integer. But then if I ran 1.5 L, I got a warning. And, um, so what I understood is that could be this warning is because integers do take whole numbers. Yeah, that is what I think. Right. John, that makes okay. All right. <laughs> so there are two important differences between doubles and integers. So doubles are approximations. They do represent floating point numbers that can't be precisely represented with a fixed amount of memory. Therefore, we should consider all doubles as approximation. Um, so e.g. the square root of seven. So if we do this, so um, forget about this. I had earlier done square root of two and then I raised to power two, but then if I do x three minus two, without having this option, it gave me uh, the scientific numbers 
and I mentioned below that I tend to have challenges <laughs> reading the two. So I remove them to just have them as the zero point, the number of decimal places that can be can bring the book up. So when working with floating numbers, it is common that the calculation includes some approximation. Hence, when we compare floating numbers, we should use um, the mere function from the player package instead of using the double equal sign as it allows for some numeric to, numerical tolerance. So at first I hadn't understood what this was, but doing an exercise um, after this kind of makes sense. So um, what I understood before was that it will compare the 1.745 if it will compare if these are the same and returns a false. But if I looked at the source, it does compare like 1.7 or 2 minus 1.75, it should be less than some tolerance, which was, allow me, will, I haven't, <laughs> haven't understood that well, so we'll see it in the exercise. But John, if you want to add more, please yeah, do. I, I I actually went down a little bit of a rabbit hole doing pretty much the same thing of, so the default tolerance on near uses this built in um, machine dot machine um, list, which is a bunch of information about how does your computer deal with numbers, especially doubles. And so it's like, what is, uh, well, um, the one that it uses there is what is it? It's the machine double dot EPS, which is like the the error. I don't remember what it stands for. Um, let me see if I can load this up real quick. Uh, smallest positive floating point number x such that one plus x is not equal to one. So, um, what all that comes down to is. Your machine can only think in so small of numbers for doubles, or it only, it's not that it only can, but it only deals with numbers down to, I think it is 2.2 times 10 to the negative 16 or so. Let me hold on a second. Oops. Um, actually, let's do this the safe way. Okay. So if we do. Um, Uh, let's see. Oh, darn. I need to do the SciPen thing. Um, what is it? It is, uh, what's the, 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 the thing to get it to show more precision? Um, I'm trying to get this knocked out real quick. Um, <laughs> I can't get a good example. So if you... <laughs> The, the, the whole point is there is some number that is the smallest number that your machine can actually tell the difference between it and zero. So if you say like, um, oops, let's see, does this work? But if I do, uh, eh, no. um, and so that's what near is using. It's saying, what is that number that's so small that uh, your machine can't tell the difference between that number and zero? If, if the numbers are different by that or less, then they are the same. So even though there can be weird things that happen in between, it's just checking, are those, are those the same? Or, or is, it, is the difference that small? If the difference is that small, then they're the same number because the machine could be doing weird rounding, it could whatever. And then you can also set a tolerance when you call near to say, I only care about whether they're within 0.01, for example. Um, it's a way to kind of auto round everything to compare. Uh, but by default, so, it's rounding to a, a value that is basically zero. John, if you don't mind me asking then, so that's a way to manage precision then, correct? Precision meaning the length of decibels after the calculation. Right. Okay. Um, that would depend on your computer. Like, is there a difference yes. between like older machines and newer machines? So it almost never matters. Um, but the reason that it's built in as this um, 
variable is when it when R builds on your machine, it checks to see if there's some weird weird value for this because I don't know I don't know what cases cause it to be different, but it's possible for it to be different. And so R has this thing built in. Um, it's funny I did exactly what Lucy did. I was like, wait, what does near do exactly? And then saw that it has this default tolerance. And I, I didn't know that that, I, I think I had used that once before. Like you can do, um, like this is one that's interesting where one of the things that's in that dot machine thing is what is the largest integer that you can have? Now, again, that should be the same for everyone because it's 32-bit integers and they should be stored in a certain way. Um, actually, okay, that one, it says it's always two times, two to the 31st minus one. So it's always that, but it's still, it's checking, you know, it's it's got these things built in so you can check um, all these different things. Like uh, what is the... Um, like how many bits are reserved to represent the exponent in a double and it'll return that and again these are they all have normal values but in theory something could make them weird and so it it lets you uh check on that very much a, a um you know not really part of what he's trying to go through in the chapter but it's why things like integer versus double matter is machines have to store things like they they aren't storing them with with infinite precision so things can be weird and that's it's useful to think of that because i have had bugs like once or twice ever in things i've been working on i've had cases where oh right that is failing because i tried to store an integer that's bigger than the biggest integer that this machine can store or things like that. So like if you do the, um, uh, oops, if I do dot machine uh, plus integer max, oh, hold on, what is it doing? Um, oops, one sec, type of, yeah, okay, there we go. If you add one to the highest integer, it becomes a double. And actually, let me do it with one L. Um, yeah, okay. And if I do here, <laughs> there we go. And then if I if I do it with one L, I'm telling it, no, I want it to be an integer. integer. It says, I can't do that. It's uh, the maximum, maximum integer plus one L is an integer, but it's NA. It's, I don't know what that is. It's, it's, infinity is but it's not infinity so it's like i don't know what it is um and it's one of those cases where like when you get that in in code you know more random than what i'm showing here but where it's like all of a sudden it's turning values into na that can be confusing if you don't remember there is a highest number that r can deal with as an integer um there are packages there's a package i think it's called big int for allowing you to work with 64-bit integers instead of 32-bit, which lets you have much bigger integers. Um, but it's uh, like it'll only work on certain machines and there are all kinds of things. Um, it's just, it's one of those things that it's good to know these things exist <laughs> when you're working on things so that when you get a weird uh, error, the, the, the math ones, I can't remember. There are a few cases where it's a relatively simple calculation to a human, but computers are technically doing everything in binary. And so, you know, it, it's like, um, it, it, it'll come up with something where you end up with these values aren't equal. It's like, yeah, yes, they are. You know, like the square root of two squared is not two, something like that. It's like, what? <laughs> um, but it's because, uh, you know, it's uh, the, these very slight differences. Yeah, there we go. That, that was exactly it. Um, okay. Square root of two squared is not two, as far as R is concerned, because it's very slightly off. And that's where that deplier near function um, 
can take care of that. So, oops. All right. <laughs> and with that, I think I can let you uh, continue. <laughs> Right. Thank you so much. That makes sense. <laughs> okay, so the other difference is that integers have one special um, value, that is the NA, while doubles have four, NA, non, in, and sorry, positive infinity and negative infinity. And this other special, these other three special uh, values, they do arise when we're doing division. So for example, we're dividing negative one with zero, it returns negative infinity. We divide zero and zero, it returns none. And uh, one divided by zero, it returns the positive infinity. So if we want to check the special values, we use the helper functions, that is, is, that is infin infin sorry, infinity, infinite, yes, and is um, dot in infinite, and is dot none, instead of now using the, the double equal signs function. So we have this example. Remember, I said that if we divide negative infinity with zero, it returns and sorry, negative one divided by zero, it returns negative infinity. So if we want to check if this is finite, it will return false because we know that that is infinite. So uh, for that, if we want to check now using the is dot infinite, so negative one divided by zero to be Positive, sorry, negative infinity. So, and then it returns true. And for this, which is zero divided by zero, we know that it is the none. It returns false. Um, but for the positive one divided by zero, which is positive infinity, does return true. true. So, if we check using NA, the is dot NA, it will only return true for zero divided by zero, the none value. And we can check the none values using the is dot none. So we know this zero divided by zero returns true, and for the rest is false. And it has we have a summary here in this um, table for what we have just discussed. So now we go to we go to the most complex, which is the character. And this is because each element of a character is a string, and a string does contain an arbitrary amount of information. So R uses a, R uses sorry global string pool, which implies that each unique string is only story in is only stored in memory once, and every use of the string points to that representation. So this does reduce the amount of memory needed by duplicated strings. So if you want to see this, the memory will use the function of objects underscore size, which is from the prior function, sorry, prior package. And um, so we have this vector. This is a reasonably long string. And if you check its size, we find that it is 152 bytes. But now if you create another vector y, which is this x repeated a thousand times, if you look at the object size, then now we have the 8,144 bytes. So we, I, I didn't understand this, but I, I'm hoping John or anyone can come through. So why doesn't take up, um, why doesn't take up a thousand times X as much memory as X? And this is because each element of Y is just a pointer to that same string. So a pointer is eight bytes, yes. I think it's. I I think it's way easier to see this if you instead of using a thousand, use two, and you'll see that it only adds eight bytes. It instead of or eight, yeah, eight bytes. So if you just change the one thousand to two, not two thousand, just two. Oh, sorry. Two. And so if if you think about it, if if each one took up the same amount of space. Then it would be it should take, uh, you know, um, it should take the same amount as x took, which was one fifty two. So it should take three hundred and four. You know, you can do that arithmetic in your set in your head. But, um, and actually, can you just run the whole block so that I can 
see the, all yeah. the numbers. Um, there we go. That was weird. Uh, I don't know what the 170 whatever was coming from, mm -hmm. but the so X takes up 152 bytes. Y isn't twice as much as X. It's just eight bytes more than X because it needs that eight bytes to say, "Hey, look over there," and that's all that it is. Is it's a a pointer to that same location. Um, I found it another um interesting way to do it is if you just make another variable that is that same string that you you know typed in separately and the the reason this is important is obviously like if you have a table of names and someone's name appears three million times in that table r is only storing that name once but it's storing and then it stores references to that same instance of that name um again this is one of those things where it probably doesn't come up with most things you're working on. You don't necessarily care. But if you're doing a lot of text processing, um, that can take up a lot of RAM, like dealing with uh, all the different texts. And the fact that R handles this for you is kind of really nice. Like you don't have to worry about um, it, it. It basically, it means factors don't matter as much as um, they otherwise would, would, because it's already kind of treating every string as a global factor. It's saying out of all the possible values, it has that one that's over at this address. I don't have to restore it. You know, I'm not storing it over and over and over. I'm just storing it the one time. Um, it's another, it's an interesting thing to have tickling your memory when you're trying to deal with memory problems. You, it teaches you that don't take the time to try to index it yourself probably like you're not going to get anything out of um, making a lookup table of your strings because ours already basically doing that. It's already done that work. Um, I mean, there's a little bit of overhead on the lookup, so you, you can sometimes get a little bit out of it, but there's probably other things that would be more useful uh, to, to deal with when you're running so, out of RAM. Yep. Can I just ask then like a, a clarification? So I think he was getting into how um, R also stores data frames that have either the same types of, you know, columns in a similar idea, right? So you don't store, say that you have a data frame A and it has yes. columns A through C, and then you have a data frame B and it has columns A through D, right? So then it doesn't store A and B separately. It just says that B has one extra column then a. So how, how does that work? Like, like you're saying, right? Um, all of these things are stored in bits, which are locations. And so how do these pointers and things work? Like what is a pointer in like the binary bits or? Uh, that's the, uh, I don't know exactly. That's the, all the okay. memory management type of okay. stuff for programming. <laughs> Technically, like all Everything is just pointers to memory, basically, and moving around those pointers. And that's mm -hmm. where any computation comes from, really. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, it's just a, a, a little, it's an address that's saying, here's where you should look for that value. And okay. so that's what that eight bits, eight bytes, that eight bytes is, hey, over here is where that character is stored. Okay. Uh, okay. And so you always have to add those eight. Um, and so technically his math, when he when it's a thousand, his math is slightly wrong because it's actually 999 times eight plus the original one, which is the full 152. Right, um, okay. But uh, you know, each of those okay. extra ones is just a pointer. The So the data frame thing is just um, when they're modified from one another, like it, it doesn't figure out that they happen to be the same. Whereas okay, the global, okay. the global character or global string pool, whatever they, he calls it, um, it doesn't matter. Like you can create them separately, and R is still putting them in that same memory location. It's this is a you know if you have another oh. string that you create that is this is a reasonably long string, that other string will also still go to that one memory location. Um, which I'm yeah. sure means technically when you create a new string, R probably has to do a little bit of work to find that address. Like mm -hmm. 
do I already have this? Yes, I do. It's here. But when you go back and like repeat, it, it's faster. And you're muted, Ryan. I don't know if you're trying to say. No, something. I'm talking to my. No, I'm talking to myself. But I was uh, <laughs> so. If you don't mind, if I extend on this subject real quick to answer Sandra's question, I lightly touched into hard drive forensics. And then also we have a crash hard memory that we use on our vehicle. Um, so I get involved in a lot of file allocation. Um, in mm -hmm. most hard drives, you have a uh, stored, it's, it's, a, it's a tiny database, but it is all of your uh, sectors. Uh, these are, you know, your, your memory sizes, you know, the, the, the little tiny slivers on a hard drive. Um, mm -hmm. Now, I, I know I'm talking about spindle drives, but SSDs and RAM and other memory storages kind of work the same way. There's a master table that references exactly where in memory that's located. Now, in oh. ours case, when you're in the runtime environment, it's usually like John had mentioned, it's storing it in RAM. If you mm -hmm. were to access hard drive memory, the pointers that, that John's referring to, uh, it's managing all of those uh, points of stored memory. So it is efficient uh, with the uh, uh, the names. I, I found John's comment about the names only only storing once, but you have 3 million records of them. So it's just pointers at these other uh, uh, places. Uh, I can't really answer the question about the table though. Uh, that one, John, I'll, I'll leave back to you, but it, it, it's a hard drive calculation piece uh, when, when you're dealing in memory, so. Okay. Yeah. Um, and, and so, yeah, it is like R has a lot of memory management things because it's made for working with, you know, tables of values where you'll often have a repeated character string, for example. And so they took mm -hmm. that into account when they were designing kind of under the hood. How does it think of of strings? It puts them all in this global pool. And then like a way to you can kind of think of it as that global pool is a giant factor that has every string that you have used in your mm -hmm. R session. Mm -hmm. And then instead of it really storing the full character, it just stores, okay, which address within that factor is this one? And it happens to take eight bytes to store that. Okay. And then you were saying that for tables or tables or, or whatnot, um, it's slightly different because it's if you modify it, right? So right. that's say that you now create a new column. So then it'll reference A, but it'll say that B is that. So look over there plus this new column or something like that. Something like that. And I don't okay. I don't remember the exact um, way. Like eventually it will split it into a separate memory address completely. If, you know, um, I don't remember what cases where it, it says, oh, these are different enough now that I can't just think of this one as a modified version of that one. Mm -hmm. um, but I definitely know, like, if you make multiple, if you say, you know, A it gets meant empty cars, B gets A, C gets B, whatever, mm -hmm. all of those will just be pointing to the same memory address until, like, if you delete one of them, and then it's like, oh, the chain's broken, now I've got to make it separate, or oh, I see. I things see. like that. Okay. Um, so it, it does all these tricks, and most of the time you don't have to care about them, except... When you're working with some giant thing and you're trying to get it to fit into your RAM and you go, okay, I'm going to, then I'm going to make a giant factor to try to trim it down. Oh, actually that won't have that much of an impact because ours got the global string pool. So let me think of something else to try to make it smaller. Right, so that's right, where right. these things are useful. That's um, so interesting <laughs> because I, I feel like my representation of, you know, two tables is very, very different than how, you know, the computer represents it. And it's just <laughs> interesting to learn, you know, different systems, I guess. So, yeah, it's all part, it, it all goes hand in hand with the um, lazy evaluation idea mm -hmm. where it's, mm -hmm. you know, again, it's efficient, not lazy. Um, yeah. I am, yeah. I am going to have an efficient afternoon today and uh, just, be on the couch all day um anyway so uh where so let's see where are we sorry about the tangent no i think it's good so let's try to finish up this the character piece and then i think that's probably where we will end for today can i ask one last question after lucy's <laughs> done with the character piece 
just in general about vectors and where that name comes from. <laughs> um, I'll, I'll save it to the end. Yeah. Yeah. Let's, okay. Let's go ahead and do missing values. Uh, okay. or at least okay. we'll try to do missing values and then we'll wrap up there. Okay. So each atomic vector has its own missing value. Um, for logical, it's NA. For integer, it's N underscore integer underscore. And then for double, it's this function where it's NA underscore real underscore. And for character, is as this. Um, but we have been told that we don't need to know about these different types since we can always use the NA and it will be converted to its correct type using the implicit quotient rules. So we'll discuss about the implicit quotient rules in the next section. And, um, but however, sorry, however, there are some functions that are strict about the inputs. Therefore, it's useful to have this knowledge sitting at the back of your pockets so you can be specific when needed. And uh, that's about the missing values. So the other one is on the exercises. All right. Um, let's yeah. Let's look at these exercises. I think we've we've got a few minutes, so let's uh, let's take a look. Um, yeah. So the first question we need to yeah, the first question we need to describe the difference between is between finite uh, and not is dot infinite function, and I tried doing that. So I created an x vector where I this like what had seen the negative one which returns infinity this is the none and the positive infinity this is the numeric and you have an integer and lastly an na so I when I ran the is dot finite x it returned true only for the sorry returns only for the non missing values that is the five and the integer five and so if I run uh, the is dot infinite x returns true for the positive infinite and positive finite sorry positive finite infinite sorry and negative infinite but the rest are false and when I run uh, not is dot infinite x I think it's if I understood well it does the opposite of the is dot infinite so it will return the the values that are not finite, infinite, sorry. <laughs> so yes, yeah, so we have this is true in, so for five and so numeric five and integer five, it's true. And for NA is true. So it only returns false for infinite and positive, negative infinite, yeah. And I made the summary here that infinite function does consider the non-missing numeric values to be finite. And this negative infinite, the non-positive infinite are considered to be finite. And um, are not considered, sorry, are not considered to be finite. And is dot infinite does consider only the positive infinite and negative infinite as infinite. And so if I run this, this not, in fine, is infinite, it does consider the positive infinite and negative infinite to be finite values, but the non-missing numeric values, the non and NA are not to, are not considered as infinite. Yeah, I think I that makes sense. Mm -hmm. I think yes. a useful thing to think about with the is functions are, is to think of them as like, is definitely finite. And so it'll return true it basically, they won't return true for NAs because well, I don't know. They might be finite. They might be infi infinite. And so, is is finite when it looks at um, any of the NAs? It says no. That's not finite. It'll also say no. It's not infinite. It's I don't know what it is. So when you do the not is infinite, it's saying which things do you um, like. So which things are definitely infinite, and then what's the opposite of that? So it it, it won't, uh, it, it, it doesn't deal with NAs the same way that is infinite deals with NAs, because the is functions are saying 
like you know read the dot is definitely physically is definitely finite it is definitely infinite um and again if we just think of na as i don't know now it does bother me a little bit that we have nan which means not a number and r it seems like sometimes r doesn't take advantage of the fact that we know it's not a number and but i mean i guess here it's fine that it, is is blue finite? Uh, I don't, that doesn't make any sense. So I'll say I'll say no. Blue is not finite um, because you know not a number is basically saying it's not a number. It's not. It doesn't. It um. It's not a meaningful thing to think of it as finite or infinite. Anyway, I hope that was more helpful than harmful. <laughs> <I'm afraid. laughs> So this is about the mere function that you have discussed. And uh, so right. this is when I realized about the tolerance and not equals and at thoughts. So when we look at the source, the source that is when we drop the, fun, the brackets and we'll, we run this, we have this, the source. And um, I learned that it doesn't check quality as I first, first thought, sorry, but it checks if two numbers are within a certain mm -hmm. tolerance. That is the toll, this. Um, usually given as the machine, which is given, given as this, which is the smallest floating um, point number that the computer can represent. And was, this was definitely good to know. I, I hope that is clearer. So the third question was, a logical vector can take three possible values. So how many possible values can an integer take? And how many possible values can a double take? So a hint was you use Google um, to do some research. So I, from the link of the solutions, I used Google and it actually pointed me to the links, of the, the links to the solutions. And this is what it says, that for the integer vectors, R uses a 32 bytes bit representation. That is, it can take, it can represent two raised to the power 32 different values with the integers. But one of these is set aside for the missing value, which is uh, the NA underscore integer. So if you run, uh, if you run this, I forgot that I was yeah. jumping ahead when I was doing this <laughs> earlier. <laughs> yeah. yeah, but it, at least it prepared our minds. Yeah. <laughs> so the maximum value that an integer can take is this. So I I understood it's two raised to power thirty one, then minus one. Yeah. And so like we have seen in the example provided by John, if that if we add plus one, it returns every other value as n n. So in summary, it's that the range of integer values represented in R is usually plus or minus. I was unable to write that in our markdown, so forgive me and have understand this. So plus or minus two raised to power 31 minus one, so that is the range of values. So we have the maximum integer that can be represented in R is 2 raised to power 31 minus 1 instead of 2 raised to power 32. And this is because one bit is used to represent the sign and the other one is used to represent this. I don't know if this makes sense. It didn't make sense to me because I thought this one would be representing only the NA. So where is the sign coming about? So yeah. if you think about, you know, there are two to the 32nd possible numbers that it can hold is what what we're starting from. That's what a 32-bit integer means. Half of those are positive and half are negative. So that means we take away one power of two to deal with positive and negative. And then I'm actually a little confused because also one of them is zero. And so there should be minus two. I would think, um, and so I'm not, I don't know if zero might be stored a different way in R, um, but so so one of those is NA integer, one of them zero, half of them positive, half of them negative. 
Um, I don't, I, I actually, I feel like there's one bit or one, one value missing in my head. Um, mm -hmm. And now I need to see if I can find what's going on with that. Um, is zero yeah. a integer? Well, zero L, if you type zero L, uh, let's see, uh, type of zero L, yeah, it's an integer. Hmm. So, um, I don't know, I tricked myself into not understanding this by one, like there's one extra bit, uh, not even a bit, one, um, well, yeah, there's one bit of information that's, I'm not sure where where you keep the zero. Um, but other than that, it made sense. Um, so if you do, yeah. what is it, two, to the 31 minus one is, yeah, that's that number. Um, oh, 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 because the max and the minimum are both off by one, that's why. So the, the negative number, oh. you get one number from the positive and you get one number from the negative. One of those is NA and the other one's zero. Yeah, <laughs> okay. Um. All right, was there, is there another one? Because I, I want to make sure that Sandra gets her a chance to ask her question. Um, oops. I, I can finish the part of the solution, then we can start from question okay. four next time. Sure. So as you've seen, is that an integer will return, a, an integer greater than the maximum value or will return in a value. So for the doubles, R does use the 64 bits in representation. That is, it can hold up to two raised to power 64 values. But some of these values are assigned to these special values, as we've seen. And uh, if you want to check the maximum for the double, I, we have it as this. OK. Yeah, and I, I think. Uh, <laughs> That's it. Yeah, we can start from question four. So yes, Sandra, please go ahead. Okay, sorry. So um, I guess my question is just why is the concept of a vector used to name these, I guess, what would be columns or arrays or, you know, like a an object that contains a whole bunch of elements. So that I remember um, I learned about vectors and scalars in physics. And so scalars are something that just represent a magnitude like weight, right? Or temperature or something like that. And then vectors had a magnitude and direction. And so is it because it has some sort of a ordering or like what, what is the rationale behind that? That is a good question. Like okay. it is, it, it's, it's a line. Like think of a vector as a line, such yeah. as the number line. Mm -hmm. The number line is a vector of a whole bunch of numbers. Um, it's mm -hmm. also in linear algebra. It's like it's one. It's a row or column of a matrix is a vector. Um, mm -hmm. And they are a represent. You know, it, it it's a different way of representing the same thing as what you learn in physics of like an arrow. You can you know you can represent it with um, length and direction. Or you can just like represent it with like multiple coordinates, and the vector is cl closer to representing it with multiple coordinates. Um, oh, I don't know. If, okay. Okay. Yeah. I guess that would make sense. Yeah. So each of the values within a vector is like a coordinate for that. It's equivalent to that, and yeah, so that's okay. where that name comes from, I think. Okay. Um, I, I wish I had uh, my coworker Jonathan. He used to teach physics. And I'm sure he could have nailed this explanation of why they're the same thing. But um, it's along those lines that it's another representation of that same type of vector that you're talking about. And then extend it to be character or logical or anything else, whereas normally it would just be, you know, numbers. Numbers, right. In that right. way. 
Um, okay. Because, I mean, really under the hood, everything's a number. Like, you know, we saw a character vector is a list of references to memory locations. Yeah. To go find yeah, yeah, the character. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, computers can only think in numbers. So really everything is a number under the hood. Um, and again, I hope that was more helpful than harmful <laughs> to say it that way. No, it, it makes sense. <laughs> and that is that consistent naming is across all like, you know, MATLAB and then R, Python to refer to like a vector, like I guess an array or an, I don't, I don't know what so, else you could call it. Yeah. I think R talks about vectors more than a lot of programming languages because mm -hmm. R thinks in vectors. Okay. Like most functions, in, you know, if even just like plus in R, if you do, um, you know, like one to 10 plus uh, one, and actually let's do it. There we go. Um, R knows that you mean, I want to add that one to everything in that vector. Mm -hmm. um, and a lot of, and not a lot of, but some programming languages wouldn't do the same thing. Like they don't necessarily think of everything as, uh, you know, think in vectors. Um, I see. Okay. okay. And, and then, you know, it can also do um, like, likewise, it uh, deals with, if you do something like that, where you've got one to 10 plus two to 11, it's like, okay, I, I know what you mean. I'll line up the pieces of the vector and I'll do the math there. Um, again, I think a lot of programming languages would do the same thing for that exact case, but mm -hmm. other things where, um, you know, like when you're pasting things together and it is thinking in vectors or pretty much every function can take a vector uh, because R really thinks in vectors. Um, he mentions like right. the, op the other alternative in most programming is a scalar where it's just one value. Mm -hmm. And R doesn't formally have a concept of a scalar. It's just a length one vector mm -hmm. instead of a scalar. Um, a lot of programming languages, you have to declare them differently. Like oh, a, a length one vector is a totally different thing than an array, which is you know a, a, ve or a, a vector that has length to it. Um, right. Right, 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 okay. So yeah. Okay, All right. that, that actually helps. Thanks, John. <laughs> You're welcome. So let's mark this. We're gonna start with 20.4 uh, next week and we'll continue. I, I think, I mean, we've got basically half of the chapter left. So I think we can should count on the fact that um, that's what we will take the time with. If we end up finishing early, cool, but I'm not really uh, expecting that to happen. <laughs> So, all right. I will see you all on the Slack and next week. Thanks, Bye. Lucy. Yeah, thank you very much, Lucy. That was great.